Hey everyone, welcome back to Handing the Shame Back, a channel dedicated to you beautiful survivors and those who have been trafficked across the world. This is a safe place for you to come and talk, share your stories and get some resource and support. Uh, this is part two with Paul Hutchins, who is the executive director of the Sound of Freedom movie, which is now the biggest independent movie of all time, let's just say, across the world. So, Paul's with us. We've been having a great conversation. Part two, straight back into you.com. Paul, how are you going? <laughs> Thank you, Gloria. Yeah, I'm so grateful, so grateful for the millions of good men and women who are helping to promote our film. When we first put it together, it wasn't about figuring out how to make money in the movie business. It was about creating a movement. And that's what the film is, has allowed for, is that the, the conversations that couldn't be had a year ago. You know, you it wasn't polite over a, over a dinner table conversation to talk about child sex abuse and, and child trafficking. But now, now that the movie's out, these conversations are being had millions and millions of times. And, and good adults everywhere are coming together saying, what do we need to do to fix this problem? Now, if you imagine a, a, a chain and our goal is to break this chain right so the 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 child liberation foundation you can go to liberate children.org you can our 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 logo is the universal signal of 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 something being sold it's a barcode but the center one is a broken chain and if you if you think that the last link of that chain is somewhere we don't want anybody to ever go near, which is the abuse of a child. We have to ask ourselves, what are the other links of that chain that lead to it? Because the further back we can break that chain, the better. What I was doing in leading undercover rescue missions, we were right at that very end link. We were putting pedophiles in prison. We were putting traffickers in prison. We were pulling these children out of hell, but that was the last link of the chain. We need to ask ourselves, how do we break that chain before a child is ever abused, ever? And so this, this leads us to difficult conversations, okay? I believe that one of the links of that chain that is right near the end is child pornography. If somebody is, is viewing child pornography, they are, they are eventually, they're going to want to act out on those horrific fantasies, right? And then we have to ask ourselves, okay, how does somebody get to child pornography? Well, is it rape pornography? Is it abuse part pornography? Is it and 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 realize this: almost everybody who is listening to this today has seen pornography. It doesn't mean you're going to become a pedophile, but understand this: every single one of the guys that we arrested and the women that we arrested at one time in their life started out with a hardcore addiction to pornography. The very second, the very second that we take a woman from a divine feminine to an object, we start going down a dark road. The very second that we even look at another human being as something not as good as ourselves. In fact, my very first rescue mission, I expected to see traffickers with 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 three earrings in their noses and 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 tattoos down their cheeks. The first trafficker that I met was a businessman in a white polo shirt, right? The second trafficker I met was a beautiful woman who was running a, a fake modeling agency and bringing these children in. And I came to an understanding that the common thread through all of these traffickers, wasn't earrings in their noses and, and, and tattoos all over their face. The common thread was arrogance and greed and lust. When, from an arrogant standpoint, they all saw themselves as, as more important than other people, especially these children. From a greed standpoint, whatever it took to get more money in their pocket, even if it involved the abuse of a child. 
And then of course, lust, which is this insatiable draw that starts with things like pornography. And people ask, they say, well, I'm not addicted to pornography. Well, are you? How about you stop today? You just stop cold turkey today and not even look at it for six months. And you tell me if you're addicted, right? Chances are most people, because of the fact that they need something harder to have that same fix, will lead them down these roads that eventually will lead to the abuse of a child. So yes, we need to all take a solid look at, at what mass media is feeding us, what Hollywood is feeding us, where we're breaking away from these moral foundations taught to us by our parents and grandparents, and ask ourselves what things in our life are resonating with arrogance and greed and lust, and how are those emotions negatively affecting the lives of other people? It's also a, it's also around power, isn't it? Because they say that you know to to feel that you uh, can live like this and behave like this and procure children or or rape children is is about lust. Actually, it strikes me it's a bit more about power over because yeah. the, a child has is powerless always in those situations. But Paul, I guess I, I want to come back to something you also said in part one, and you've just alluded to now without realizing it, well done you, which is grooming. And we know there's, there's four groups in society that are groomed. One is the child, the second is the parent, the third is the community, but the fourth is the society. And you've talked about that a little. Uh, you know, if, for instance, um, you know, using, replacing the word pedophile with minor attracted persons, not on my watch, no, yeah. a, you know, that sort of stuff we're being groomed. By far the biggest group, and I'd love to know your thinking around this, is not the children. It's actually the parents are the biggest group that are groomed. Out of the four, it's the children. Second point. There are three types of child abusers. One is the pedophile. So a pedophile is someone who has the thought. They want to um, have sex with a child. That's their main thought process around sexual activity. But then we get to the second group, which is the um, preferential child abuser and they are the ones who act on it so they are a pedophile acting on this not interested in sex with adults at all but the third group is a situational uh, a child sex offender and they are the ones who will do this as a revenge or as punishment have you come across any of those in your 70 rescues across the world absolutely yeah, there, there are all, all of them, all of them are there, and yeah. and uh, we found that um, some traffickers were not just trafficking other people's children; they were trafficking their own, and uh, you know it was all tied to to uh, to power and uh, feeling um, like they could control their children and and make money from them. It's just super sad. I remember one of my operations this this trafficker sent me a picture of him a selfie with him and he had his three-year-old daughter in his back seat this guy had 14 children that he was abusing and selling and he wasn't selling his three-year-old yet but i remember looking at that picture and um telling myself i am going to take down that network for the sake of that through that three-year-old in his back seat because eventually that would that would end up being her life if we hadn't taken taken down that entire operation. So um, so yes, there's there's all all kinds of ways that these children are being abused. And back to your question on the grooming of the parents, I call it I call it mass psychosis. You know, we sit back as parents and we we 
allow the water to get a little bit hotter. What I mean by that, if you know the analogy of a of a frog in a in a pan of water, and if you turn it up to boiling really fast, you know he jumps out. But if you slowly turn it up, he just slowly gets warmer and warmer until he boils to death and doesn't realize it. And that's what's happening with uh, with big media, with Hollywood, with uh, with even a lot of our governments is they're they're trying to make this kind of behavior acceptable in some way. And and uh, as you stated, saying that this is a minor attracted person, no, I don't even think that pedophile is bad enough. How about a how about a a, a life destroyer? You know, you're destroying the lives of these children. There's there's worse words that you can come up with than, you know, minor attracted adult. And uh, and we 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 have to ask ourselves why we've gotten to the point where this is the pandemic that it is, where one out of every three girls by the time they're 16 have been abused. And we have to ask ourselves, what kind of movies are we allowing into our homes? What kind of policies are we uh, allowing our politicians to put into place? And, and what kind of leniency do they have towards people who are, I mean, for a while, for a while, it was, it was, you could go to prison longer for having marijuana in your, in your purse than you could for raping a child, you know, or, or psilocybin, magic mushrooms or whatever else. These are a lot of these things. Now the FDA in the U S is coming out with new rulings saying, ah, yeah, we were wrong. Those things aren't as bad as we thought. Well, how about all those people who are in prison for years? And then the ones who are out of prison, who are abusing children, we've got a messed up system in, uh, in, in not putting the emphasis on the safety of the children. And, and I agree with you, actually, 100%. And even more, Paul, consider this. You'll know children that have been rescued, that have then tried to seek justice. For, uh, for a lot of us, and we know it's massive across the world, what happens is, is as adults, as you stated, the average age is 52 for an adult to find the courage to even speak. But in the meantime, when they try to do that, they get darvoed, which is denied, attacked, whether their credibility or their mental health. The re Reverse the order of victim and offender. See how clever it is. And that immediately shuts the survivor down and uh, has people questioning, are you sure? But he seemed really nice. And I think what well, we just have to change the focus. We have to start empowering our beautiful survivor family, you know, those beautiful men and women who have uh, either been rescued or, or been able to face into their trauma uh, we have to give them our support and resource and love because uh, through no fault of their own, they have been broken. And, and Paul, this is so big that I don't know if you knew this, but over 70% of our post-traumatic stress-disordered people are not Vietnam vets. Actually, it's people like me. That over 55% of our prisons are not full of criminals, they are full of people who have experienced child sexual abuse. Over 85% of our rehabs are full of people who have experienced child. So the cost, the cost, you know, across nations and across the whole world is just phenomenal. But, uh, to help those beautiful people, eh? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I love that you're so well versed on those numbers of the the extremely high percentage of incarcerated people within the prison system that were abused as children, and uh, and we have to ask ourselves how how big of a toll this is placing on humanity as a whole. And, yeah. and what needs to happen to fix it because now understand we can we can fix this in one generation this isn't thousands of years to fix it we have to we we have to focus on the healing side we've got to 
develop programs and tools allowing people to shed their trauma. So many men, especially, will will say, you know, I, that that thing that happened to me when I was eight years old by my by my uncle. I don't want to talk about it because it it makes me less of a man if I do. No, it doesn't. You were you were eight. You, a horrible thing happened to you from from somebody who was who was hurting themselves and they were in pain themselves. Now, that doesn't define you today. Every single cell in our bodies is brand new after a couple of years. The physical body that you had at the time that you were abused does not even exist today. And that for sure doesn't define you. There is no reason for you to hold on to any degree of guilt. There was nothing that you did. I don't even care if you were 12 and it felt good. And now you're feeling guilty because it felt good. Well, of course, your body is a phys physiological being. You're, you're, you're going to feel some, some arousal towards those things. It doesn't take away from the fact that that was a very broken person that was passing on that trauma. And if we can we can realize that we're not defined today, not only by the things that happened to us, but even the things that we did. You know, if we did some things five or 10 years ago that were out of alignment with our true self, you know, I mean, I, I, uh, I never crossed those lines, but I, I cheated on my first wife. You know, I had these big, huge parties at my house with all of the NBA players and half-dressed girls and whatever else, you know, I was living in a low vibration, a low level of consciousness with this ego and this, this pride that I had at the time. But I can release that. I don't have to be that guy anymore. And I don't have to beat myself up today for what happened then. I can realize I didn't know what I know now. I wasn't living from a place of love and peace and, and light and forgiveness. And, and, and I can live a new life. All of us, all of us can release that past. And especially you men who are listening to me today, the simple act of talking about it doesn't take away from your manhood. But what it does do is it ensures that there's a much higher percentage that you will never, ever pass that trauma on. The ones that pass that trauma on are more likely the ones that are whole. And coming out of the scene and anxiety and depression and, and acting out. On up, just talking about it, reading it and finding Finally, to just have healing retreats from adults coming that had experienced childhood sexual trauma that within, within two to four days, we can get more work done. You would just, you would just, so there's a lot of tools there, and that's fantastic. I'm glad that you have that. And I just want to say this how will people know when it's their time? to deal with this when it's in front of them, when it's in their minds, when it won't leave them alone. Equally, Paul, just a, just a little clause on that. People that have held on to this trauma have not done so willingly. It's part of the human condition. But there are many ways to start to release it. And all I would advise is if, you are a person that's needing to start releasing this trauma. Choose wisely and prepare what you wish to say because sometimes we can become even more traumatized when we tell someone we thought would be supportive and what happens is they turn around and say, are you sure I really liked him? So, you know, we I think we just need to proceed a little with caution but Paul tell me a little more about you know you've you've got the tools that you're using you're finding them really effective uh where can people go if they 
they wish to try what you're working with? Yeah, so we have, uh, thank you for asking. Um, two or three places people can go. Number one, if you want to help directly with the with the uh, rescue and re rehabilitation of the children, you can go to liberatechildren.org and uh, or just look up the Child Liberation Foundation and there's plenty of ways to contribute and to help there for adults that are wanting help to recover and I, wanting to identify ways to keep your children safe, you can go to Liberating Humanity. That's liberating, I-N-G, humanity.com. And, uh, or you can follow me on any social media platforms, just find liberating.humanity and you can find me. And, uh, and what the tools are that we've been putting together are these. Number one, um, if we've been a victim, of abuse at some time in our life, then we felt very much powerless at the time. So I've pulled in a lot of my trainers, ex Krav Maga, Navy SEALs, Green Berets, et cetera, and have put together some online programs that allow people to learn some basic self-defense skills that can keep themselves and their family safe. And just learning these skills gives you a whole new sense of confidence because of the fact that you were, you were vulnerable at one time. And, and now you can you can develop those skills so you don't feel vulnerable in, in other situations in your life. Number two, uh, we have we have people that teach uh, breath work seminars and guided meditation. Um, your your ability to to connect with your higher self, to connect with God and the divinity within yourself is one of the most powerful tools of all. And, and so many times we live this life where we have so much noise, so much going on with our cell phones and our TVs and everything else that we don't take the time to be quiet and listen and pray and meditate. And, but in doing so, you can, you can take huge strides in overcoming the, the, that, that childhood trauma that you've been holding on to. Now, if somebody wants a, a fully transformational healing experience, um, we have we have different programs where people come for four to five days, uh, usually here in Latin America, and we have healing retreats where people can come and they can learn these different modalities. We bring together groups of men or groups of women who have dealt with that trauma as children, and sometimes we bring in couples and and uh, and help help them help each other in working through it, and uh, we help identify what. What kind of things are are deep and and I kind of I I, I like it to to see it kind of like a, a maze. You know, you've got the start and the finish line, and in our in our conscious world, it's really hard to figure out how to get to that finish line. That finish line might be you know living in peace or or releasing that trauma or or not being so swift to anger or being truly present, whatever it is. And and then we're able to help them identify what that 2.0 version of themselves looks like. And then take them through some processes. Some of them we use, and I'll just I'll just go there with this because I think this is important. Some of them we use what we call plant medicine to do so. Back in the late 60s, President Nixon in the US decided he would categorize a bunch of things as schedule one drugs, meaning just as dangerous as cocaine and heroin. And these this classification went on to things like sassafras and white lily and mistletoe and psilocybin. These are different forms of psychedelics that 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 uh, you know, for example, mushrooms, people think, oh, that's so dangerous because it's a schedule one drug. No, it's safer than table sugar. There's never been a case of addiction. There's never been a case of overdose. Yet when used with a trained facilitator who understands how to help people release that childhood trauma, we can get 10 and 20 years worth of therapy done in 24 to 48 hours. And if you want to learn more about that, you can go to, to uh, you can read a book called Change Your Mind, another one called The Immortality Key that goes through the history of some of those tools and how effective they can be. In fact, John Hopkins University did a study and said that 76% of people who do a guided meditation, plant medicine journey experience using something like psilocybin, 76% say it was the number one most transformational healing experience of their life. So 
anyway, we're trying to change the laws in the US on that. And I believe that in turn, it will change in other countries. And those tools will be available for people to release trauma in, uh, in much more efficient ways. So meanwhile, you can, you can just go onto a form submission on liberating humanity and get some more information on our healing retreats worldwide. It's, um, well, it's very powerful what you're doing. And uh, the, I imagine the before and after is quite significant. It's awesome, awesome work. Thank you so much for your wonderful um, heart and your kindness to humanity, Paul. It's massive. Just as we're finishing up, is there anything you would like to um, talk to or anything, any advice you would like to give to the beautiful uh, survivors that that watch this show? Yes, I am. Of all the podcasts that I've done in the last few months, this was one I was really excited about because I honor each of you for going through the hell that you went through and choosing not to be a victim, but choosing to be a victor and choosing not to pass that trauma on to the children in your life, but instead choosing to be the, a protector of their innocence. And, uh, and the healing journey, sometimes it's hard and it's difficult, but it's worth it. Do it not just for yourself, do it for your children. Understand this, that if you took an entire year to work on yourself and help yourself heal, and then next year, you took an entire year and you mentored just two people, just two people, and you mentored them on overcoming that, that trauma from their childhood. And then the next year, they passed it on. And those two people, they each helped two people more. Do you realize that in less than 33 years? You've helped over 8 billion people. So never say that you can't do, you can't change the world. You can change yourself, heal yourself, help others to heal, and encourage them to pass that on. And in less than a lifetime, we can truly help humanity shed this trauma and find that happiness that we're all looking for. So thank you for having me on your show. And I honor every single survivor that is here. Super grateful to spend time with you. Thank you, Paul. Please stay right there. I'm just going to close out with our fabulous survivors. Wow, well, survivors, you owe me big time. I managed to get Paul on the show. And, uh, and what a gift. And how grateful are we to understand more about uh, what went on behind the scenes with all of this and the beautiful work across the world and I just want you to know you're so loved you're so you're of such value and it's such an honor to bring this to you as always I see you I stand beside you and I believe you